All right, let's open our Bibles again to the book of Esther, chapter 2. Esther, chapter 2. We've gone through verse 11. Mordecai is trying to monitor Esther's progress um, as a possible future queen of the Persian Empire. Let's read verses 12 through 14. Now when every maid's turn was come to go into King Ahasuerus, after that she had been twelve months according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of their purification accomplished to wit, six months with oil of myrrh, and six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of the women. Then thus came every maiden unto the king, whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. In the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women, to the custody of Sheashgaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. She came in unto the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name. One thing was believed, and that's plain enough. Uh, a woman was regarded as unclean before she was married and not a very high estimation of women in the ancient world or the Middle Eastern world or the uh, Far Eastern world. And it took 12 months for them to clean up and fancy up and pretty up um, before they could be married. Verse 14 shows you how an Oriental ruler treated the women in his harem. Each one would spend the night with the king each one could take anything she needed, which she thought it would help persuade the king to choose her as the future queen. But if she wasn't chosen, she wasn't released back to her regular life. She was relegated to the status of concubine and kept in the harem until the king wanted her again, which in some cases never happened. And the same situation exists to some degree in parts of the Muslim world today. Muhammad had 14 wives that they recognized, but um, availed himself of any number of servant girls as well. And, uh, but he only allowed his followers to have no more than four. I remember when Brother Chris Owens came back from his tour in um, was it Bahrain, went to Bahrain. He showed us pictures of certain um, wealthy Arabs and sultans' homes, uh, which were set up to accommodate four wives in their own respective uh, housing units, along with the main house where he lived. Uh, Muhammad's most famous wife was named Aisha, and she was six years old when her father arranged a marriage between her and Muhammad. Uh, nine years old when Muhammad first slept with that girl. He was 30 at the time. He could be regarded as uh, having been a definite pedophile. There's no other way to define him. Um... In the Holy Hadith, which is a book of sayings and stories attributed to Muhammad, um, the details of that encounter are given, as well as words of declaration or revelation Muhammad would give. In the Holy Hadith, Muhammad recommended drinking camel urine when you were hot and fatigued, some Pilgrims came to visit him from the long journey. He recommended they drink camel urine and they would feel refreshed, you know. Some people drink Gatorade, but apparently camel urine did the job for them in those days. He said that uh, Allah, or rather not Allah, but uh, Satan, would urinate in the ears of Muslims if they fell asleep during their prayers. He liked urine a lot, evidently. And uh, you'd have to be, and, and a, lot of, a lot of 
people who have studied his life and his his uh, biography um, speculate he was epileptic in those days when he would claim to have a seizure and the angel Gabriel would reveal something to him. And uh, you'd have to be uh, half out of your mind to follow that person because he was half out of his mind to begin with. And what can you say about uh, someone like with those credentials? Well, let's continue verses 15 all the way down through verse 20. Now, when the turn of Esther, the daughter of um, Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken unto, the, unto king Ahasuerus, into his house royal, in the tenth month, which is the month Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight, more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast. And he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. God is obviously working on behalf of Esther in these circumstances. Haggai um, is impressed with her. Look back, if you will, at verses 8 and 9. Um, the last part of verse 8 says, uh, Unto the king's house, to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women, and the maiden, Esther, please him, and she obtained kindness of him. So not only was he impressed with Esther, but it says um, uh, Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her, here in verse 15. Now, if God wasn't involved in this situation, then as a real coincidence, you have love at first sight among everyone who ever sees the girl. Uh, notice verse 16 is an important doctrinal verse. And let me read verse 16 again. So Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus in his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. This is a type of what we would call a post-tribulation or a late tribulation rapture of a Jewish bride. And it takes place, it says, in the seventh year of his reign, here, verse 16. It's a type of the uh, seventh year of the tribulation. But in this verse, it says it takes place in the tenth month. The tenth month on our calendar is October. But words such as octagon, octopus, mean eight, not ten. <clears throat> the tenth month in the old world calendar was approximately December. So December, like decade, decimal, has to do with the number 10. That was the 10th month of the ancient calendars. Uh, verse 18 says he made a release to the provinces. That would have been a day off for the feasting to take place. It also says he gave gifts there in verse 18. Let me ask you a question. What holiday falls in December and is characterized by a day off? It's characterized by gift giving and a lot of feasting. And uh, let me ask you another question. Is Christmas mentioned in the Bible? Well, there have been a lot of celebrations uh, in December over the centuries. A few of the more contemporary ones we can think of would be not just Christmas, but um, uh, Hanukkah and Kwanzaa. The uh, black nationals or the black uh, uh, civil rights movements, they created that one back in the uh, 60s. A guy named Ron Karenga 
uh, invented Kwanzaa back in the late 1960s. But um, turn, if you will, to Revelation chapter 11 for just a minute. Revelation 11. Here in Revelation 11, the two witnesses have been slain by the Antichrist and their bodies, their dead, their dead bodies, lay in the street for three and a half days uh, during that time. Notice verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. When someone's sin is being exposed by a preacher, that person's under a lot of torment. Many times. They're, they don't like hearing it. They don't like having their dirty laundry aired. Or so it seems. They, I remember a guy was sitting under the preaching here um, several years ago, and afterwards came forward when we gave an invitation, and I was able to pray with him, and he received Christ, and he said, you know, it, it, Mike, it seemed like everything you were saying in that sermon, you were, you were describing me personally. I wasn't. I had no idea that whatever I was saying was ringing true in his own mind and conscience. But that's what, what the uh, preaching by God's uh, man can do on occasion. That's what the Word of God can do in the heart of someone who's guilty, and they know they're guilty. <clears throat> And uh, it'll be that same reaction multiplied by a thousand times around the world during the uh, tribulation. Um, and amidst all the holidays celebrating and uh, the last, um, uh, last minute rescue, I should say, of tribulation Jews takes place before the end of the tribulation. Look, um, continue here, Revelation 11 and verse... Verses 11 through 15. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe was passed, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world, or rather, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So, just before the end of the tribulation, there's a last-minute rescue of the Jews who have been suffering under the man of sin, uh, right at following the, the um, two witnesses going up. Notice again the term virgins showing up in the context, um, if, we, if we can, uh, of a post-tribulation rapture. The... Um, in Revelation, those virgins, are 144,000, are gathered the first time on the earth, in Revelation chapter 7. And they're gathered the second time, just as verse 19 in our text says, and when the virgins were gathered together the second time, the second time they're gathered is in Revelation 14, and they're gathered in heaven. Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5, and we won't turn there tonight. Verse 20, um, let me read that again. Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people, as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther did, did the commandment of Mordecai, like as when she was brought up with him. That's self-explanatory. We mentioned that back in verse 10. Let's read verses 21 to 23 at the end of uh, Esther chapter 2 here. 
In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Big Than and Teresh, of those which kept the door, were wroth and sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen. And Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Verse 21 describes an assassination plot by the two by two of the doorkeepers. And you know, God can even use the uh, a murderous conspiracy to accomplish his purposes if he wants. Um, you don't need to turn, but let me read, turn forward verse, uh, uh, rather, to Psalm 76. Psalm 76, and notice there verse, let me notice there verse 10. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. And that's what's happening here. The wrath of man shall praise thee. And, um, the remainder of wrath shall be restrained. That's uh, what's happening here. Someone's uh, attempt to murder the king ends up uh, helping aid the Jew during his time of captivity. Uh, you wouldn't think so on the surface, but that's what's happening here. Mordecai, Mordecai discovers the plot, and he tells Queen Esther, uh, Esther tells the king, in Mordecai's name, the end of verse 22 states, verse 23, and when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Oriental kings were despots. They were absolute dictators, uh, much more than Adolf Hitler was ever thought of as a dictator They'd just lop your head off or kill you if you looked at them wrong and they took a dislike to you. All they had to do was give the word and it would be done. Um, Mao Zedong, I guess we could have classified him as an oriental uh, dictator. Um, he was responsible at Chairman Mao. He was responsible for at least 45 million people being Put to death in China. Some estimates go as high as 70, 75, 80 million of his own citizens put to death. He was one of those communists that um, Bernie Sanders would probably have admired. You say, I'm not, you're, you're, you're overstating. Well, he liked Fidel Castro. He liked the Soviet Union. Uh, why wouldn't he like Mao Zedong and the way he dealt with any uh, problems that came up? But one day there's going to be an absolute ruler, an oriental ruler, who runs the world in absolute righteousness. And um, in an or under the reign of an oriental monarch, a dictator, there were no civil rights. Nobody had a, a right to speedy trial or trial by a jury of his peers. There was no, let's get to the facts. If the king uh, didn't like you, uh, he could have you killed. Under the Lord Jesus Christ, however, he won't need to inquire because he knows everything to start with. There won't be any need to call witnesses forth um, because <laughs> You and think about you and I after the rapture, after the um, marriage supper of the Lamb, when we come back as an uh, army of glorified saints on white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean, Revelation 19, verse 16, coming back with Jesus Christ in glorified supernatural form, Joel 2 describes us. We will have perfect knowledge. And if you and I will have by that time been transformed into the image of Jesus Christ and 
our domain is not only planet Earth, but the entire universe by extension, you won't be able to go anywhere without running into Jesus Christ. You follow my uh, analogy there. And the idea that some things will be done in secret and not found out, um, and the, or that um, glorified beings like their Savior won't know about, I expect to have absolute knowledge of everything when I'm made like the glorified Son of God one day. And uh, you should expect that as well. So when the Lord Jesus Christ gives his word, it'll be absolute. Let me run you to two places and then we'll be finished for tonight. Look forward at Psalm 2. Psalm 2 and Revelation 19. I'll give you a second to find those two places. Psalm 2 and Revelation chapter 19. Psalm 2, verses 8 and 9. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And Revelation 19, verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That is the um, operating procedure for the Lord Jesus Christ when he begins to rule planet Earth and the rest of the universe by extension as the rightful heir to planet Earth, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I'm so happy <clears throat> that I met him on November 5th, 1967 uh, for the first time uh, in real time in my young life and it changed me forever and there's not a day that's gone by since then that I've doubted I was going to I doubted why God could love me as um, flawed as I am and have been but I've never doubted that I was saved and uh, I, I pity those who wrestle with it and doubt it it's unfortunate they they can't have peace and assurance that if God saves them or has saved them, he saved them good. He saved them well, and he saved them for sure, for certain, and forever, permanently. And there's one thing you should, you know, you can worry about a lot of things, even as a Christian, but one thing you should never worry about is going to hell. You don't have to worry about it. It's been taken care of. The Lord Jesus Christ suffered for your sake and took the judgment for your sins uh, as your substitute and when you trusted him to save you, his righteousness and the, the merit of it all was credited to you and your sins were covered by his death and a great transaction took place and now God sees you covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He no longer sees you stained with the, the guilt of your own sin. He now sees Jesus Christ having borne your sin and the guilt and consequences of it have all been covered by his shed blood.